why do you think we should still care about these films in an era of like 3D internet television and IMAX and all those other digital formats? Well, I mean, to ask yourself, why should you care about Dickens? Why should we care about Shakespeare? Why should we care for, for any of your literary heritage? You know, I mean, no, the films are not, films do not exist only in the year 2017, you know, uh, it, it's a whole culture. All of these films have great art, they have uh, great performances, they have great lessons to tell us. You know, it's very interesting, here we are at Slapstick, tonight we're going to show Charlie Chaplin's The Great Dictator. When was that made? It was made in 1940. But it is the most topical film you can imagine. I mean, here we are at this ridiculous moment in our history, we don't know where anything's going, but the, the, the world looks more honest than it yes. has in, in, in decades. And the best thing that, you, that is said about it is it in this film. I mean, the, the, uh, it is the most topical film for the moment, old as it is. Yes. Yes. And also, what draws you to um, Charles Chaplin, uh, particularly uh, as an actor? Chaplin is something utterly different. Uh, I, uh, what is, what is, I mean, I'm saying that tonight we're going to look at the, at the Great Dictator, which seems the most topical thing for January 1917. He, 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 ha he was a man who never went to school, and yet he had such a, an incredible intelligence, such a sense of what human beings are, what happens in some human beings, what makes human beings the world. But he also had a great sense of, of the history of his times. Uh, and, and if you look at films like Modern Times or The Great Dictator or A Key in New York, you find that he is, here is a small man who is giving his thoughts on us, on our times, on, on our lives, on our times, on our history. I mean, he's, he, for me, he's a very special person. I mean, he's not just yes. one of the movie stars. He's, he's, he's something unique on his own in our civilization. And um, also, I understand that um, you also met um, Harold Lloyd when he was in his later life. Um, uh, that must have been amazing. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, it was in a way. I mean, he was, he's very, he's very charming. Very, he, he's very well. He's very strong. He's very, uh, very good-looking man. He looked very much like Harold Lloyd. Um, but somehow, I didn't didn't get a big thrill. It was really like meeting a very nice American businessman. I'm sorry to, to, to be a bit down with that one. I mean, I love Harold Lloyd, but in, in his later years. Uh, uh, it, it wasn't really the same, at least as I found, it wasn't the same person. But I was very proud to have met him. Yeah, in fact, um, it's funny you should mention that because I saw a documentary done by Kevin Brownlow and the late David Gill where one interviewee said, Harold Lloyd was an ordinary American businessman who lived a conventional life. He would get up in the morning and go to work. His work was being a genius, and I think that <laughs> outlines or highlights exactly what you have just mentioned. Yes. I, I, was, I, was, I was thrilled to meet him, but yes, he was a businessman, and okay, he was a businessman whose business was being a genius. <laughs> or had been being a genius, because of course by that time he was no longer working. And um, of course, you. Also, one thing you did say in one interview, apparently uh, describing when you did meet him, that his old producer, Hal Roche, said he wasn't, Harold Lloyd was never a comedian, but he was the best actor to be comic. Yes, I think uh, that is very true. Uh, Roche was wonderful. I mean, uh, 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 I think I presented Roche on stage when he was very, very close to a hundred, and he was absolutely marvellous. Uh, he... Uh, Put, put, put a, a good little lady in his way and he didn't know what he was going to do. And uh, up on the stage he was marvellous and uh, I was introducing him and he said, well, you'd better quit, be quick, let me sit down, I'm nearly 100. I'll fall down if you don't let me sit down. But he was absolutely great, you know. Also, what do you make of um, other um, silent screen comedians, physical comedians, like, um, say, Buster Keaton? Well, what do you mean, what do I make of them? You know, each one had his own style, each one had his own genius. I think... 
Hound was different, but they, all the others had learned their craft yes, in the music halls. Indeed. I mean, the music halls were an wonderful school for theatre, a wonderful school for getting to understand your, yes. your audience, knowing what your audience wanted, knowing what was going to work, what was not going to work. And uh, it's interesting, we're, we're at the Slapstick Festival, and we, we meet a lot of you know, here, a lot of people meet us, us, stage comedians or people who have worked on the music halls, and it's very close to and, um, I also understand that Slapstick Comedy um, didn't just happen in the silent era, it also went beyond that, like... Um, in the talking age, in fact, well into the talk, it's like even into the 50s and 60s, like, for instance, the one of Chaplin's favourite comics was the British comedian Norman Wisdom, who incorporated, I say, incorporated a lot of slapstick elements in this film, particularly in his first colour production, The Early Bird, for several minutes at the beginning, there's hardly any dialogue with him getting up out of bed all drowsy and going up and downstairs and falling over and all that. And I suppose, what do you think, what do you think of that, like, with Slapstick beyond the silent era? Um, the Slapstick is forever. <laughs> the Slapstick goes back to, uh, to, to the prehistory. And I think it, it, it's, you know, it's just part, part of life. You know, it, it, you, you, know you, you walk around the street, and there's all, you're always going to find a bit of Slapstick happening. I, 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 mean, I, I go back so far that I remember seeing Norman Wisdom when he first appeared on television, stopped doing a, a, an act with a camera. I was absolutely thrilled and immediately wrote an article called A New Comedy, A New Clown, uh, which was, the, which was, I think, probably the first one, the first article of Norman Wisdom. So I've got quite a lot of memories, but no, I mean, slapstick, slapstick is. I mean, uh, the slapstick festival isn't isn't just nostalgic, it's, it's about it's about something that happens here and now. And of, uh, yeah, of course, in my case, as a young person who loves slapstick silent films, um, do you have um, any advice on how to get the younger generation to, to share this passion that I have and probably other younger people? I don't know, I mean, I think that, that uh, at the moment, uh, we are in a period where, where, where it, it's stand-up comedy, it's talk, talk comedy, yeah. but um, I, I think that it is inevitable that comedians are going to develop a, 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 more, a more expressive, a more physical way of doing things. And uh, I don't know, I, I watch American uh, 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 TV, uh, TV uh, comedy programs a lot, and uh, although very often the comedians are just sitting there talking. In fact, if you watch them, there's a lot of activity also. I mean, you can have slapstick, I think, in a very small, small sense. It doesn't have to be falling all over the stage. And one final question to round off this interview. Are you still looking forward to any of the, uh, any other any other events at Slapstick this weekend? Uh, I'm looking forward immensely to The Great Dictator just because I think it's the film of the moment. <laughs> yeah, particularly with the yes, inauguration yes. of Trump. Yes, yes. Well, thank you very much for the interview, David, and enjoy the rest of the weekend. Thank you.